Okay, so has everybody made new friends now? Somebody know somebody new? Okay, so that exercise is twofold. We actually, I hate being on the podium, sorry. We're actually in probably one of the greatest communities I've ever been a part of. Um, quick personal story. I went to another conference earlier this week. And when I showed up to the hotel, my credit card was denied. Within one minute of seeing a tweet saying, crap, in Grand Rapids, hotel just denied my credit card. I had three people offer to pay my room. So, I mean, that's partly because they're my friends, but they're friends I have through this community. The bigger issue is, I was at the, uh, that same conference, and there was a person, we don't, when I had left, they hadn't known what had happened yet, but he actually passed away at the con. He, everybody thought he was sleeping. As far as they knew, he didn't have any friends there with him, nobody to check up on him. He sat down at some point between lunch and dinner, and when somebody shook him, tried to shake him awake at dinner, they found out he had been dead for several hours. So, you know, and that's kind of a failing of our community because he didn't network with people, he didn't know anybody. And it really affected the con. And it affected me personally because he was two tables away from me. And I looked over and, oh, the guy's asleep. You know, I'm kind of jealous. So trying to prevent something like that ever happening again, you know, maybe it won't be multiple hours the next time. Maybe it won't even happen the next time because of me stopping and saying, make sure you meet somebody new. And just check on the guys that, you know, sitting by himself, just stop over and say, hey, my name's so-and-so, and go. So going from there, who am I? Well, we're here to talk about Linux hardening, but who am I? My name is Radis, R-A-T-T-I-S. It's what most people know me as. They also know me as Chris J. And I go by Mr. J or just Chris, Chris J, whatever. Um, what this talk is, this talk is a basic intro to hardening. This stuff is about 15 years old. I've been in the, in the industry since 90, 96. I've been a network engineer, a Linux administrator. I'm currently a security administrator slash analyst. And my job now is to audit external connections. But along the way, I've, I've picked up stuff. I've learned everything the hard way. This is kind of give you a little bit of a roadmap of where to go. I'm not going to cover everything. I'm not going to talk about everything. I'm just trying to give you guys a bit of a direction of where to look, what to look into, and make you ask questions on how to harden this yourself. So the talk isn't going to be all inclusive. This talk actually came from, a, from three different locations, three things that happened all at once, a conversation on Twitter with two different friends, and a CTF. Um, the CTF we were at, we had some new noobs, we had some experienced people. The experienced people thought it would be fun to go start popping boxes of the noobs because they didn't bother to do simple things like install IP tables. Problem was, the noobs didn't know how, and the experienced people thought it'd be way more cool to pop these guys' boxes and teach them being noobs than it would be to actually teach them how to do these skills. So it came from there, it came from a friend when she first started getting into pen testing, she had an issue where she was using Backtrack, and this is back when Backtrack still had SSH on by default, and she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. Message pops up, you shouldn't be doing this, and then her box shut down person SSH'd in, sent a write command, you know, write to all terminals, and then shut the box down on her. And then I've got another friend who is an admin at a university. He's actually got stuff set up so when he sees a backtrack box come up on a line on his network, it shuts off the network port. So, you know, so three places where the talk came from. So it's a little bit of basic system hardening, and then we'll apply it to backtrack because, you know, hackers want to see the, the hacking side, so. I built this in a lab, I used backtrack 5, R2. Whistler is the actual laptop sitting up here. And these are the different IP addresses I use. I use an Ubuntu system and a CentOS Live CD. Ubuntu, kind of the big sexy, you know, all the new users use it. CentOS, it's Red Hat based, it was free. And I've worked in a lot of corporations that have used it in the past, usually with just default installs. So I kind of took the two big ones that you'll see out there and applied them to the lab, and it's like, this is how we're going to do this. So, on a basic install, if you do an nmap, and if I remember right, this is from outside, yeah, this is off of Astra. So this is from outside. CentOS had these two ports open to start with, 22, which is your SSH, and RPC bind. When you look at it, though, and do a net set on the box, this is everything that's open. So I've got cups, 
You know, if I'm setting this up as a server, why do I need a print server? Um, SSH, which I actually need for the lab to work. Other stuff throughout there, right? Well, there's stuff on there I don't need. I look at the Ubuntu side, and it's the same thing. I've got 22 open, which I had to open myself. But when I look at it internally, again, it's got multiple services open. And there's cups again, 631. So again, if I'm not using it for something that needs to have a printer attached to it, why do I need cups turned on? So let's turn cups off. And there's, this is the, the Red Hat way. Command is service, the name of the process, and then you can do a status to see if it's running or not. You can tell it to stop, start. If you want to make sure it stays off after reboots, you have to go in a little bit deeper, deeper, use check config. It'll show you what you have turned on at what levels. You can go through, turn it off, as I have here. And it's pretty simple. You know, one simple command, check config, levels, the levels you want to turn them off on, name of the process, and then just off. Debian and Ubuntu have changed the way they've done things recently. Usually the command that's at the top, the update RCD would work. Um, in this case you actually had to go in and make changes by mo removing things directly. You had to actually go in a little bit harder. Normally the command would work, but this particular version of Ubuntu required changes to be made in the cups config file instead of with the update RC. So connections. You know, we, we've seen the other connections that are open. We've seen everything that's been running. RPC bind, everything else, right? Well, let's block that off of IP tables. So we're going to set up a basic firewall. This slide actually is a direct copy, except I changed port 80 to 22, off of a site called Nixcraft. Great site. If you don't know it, find it, start reading it. Um, what I'm doing up here is I'm saying anything that's coming in, drop it. So it's going to hit the box and it's going to say, I'm not going to listen to you. And this is going to drop. Anything that I'm sending out is going to go out. Now, think about that for a second. Then because of internal stuff, you need your loopback going. So I've got an accept on both in and out, right? The next line though, I said drop everything that's coming in, right? Well, if you have everything being dropped, if you go out to a site, the response back from that site's going to drop your, it's going to be dropped. It's not going to come through at this point. And that's where the, um, the established, related, and um, accept comes in at. So I'm saying if I send the traffic out and it's a response to my own connection, then yeah, let it in, otherwise drop it. And I needed port 22 open, so I opened that specifically. Because I'm really lazy, I don't want to walk from my kitchen to my front room, which is like 40 feet, just to type on one keyboard, go back, type on another one. I'd rather do everything from one box in a terminal window, it's just me. And then at the very end, I say, show me what you're dropping, because I want to see what's coming in, what you're doing. And then, of course, reject all input that's not been validated at this point. Now, at times, you have to drop your table. If you make a mistake, you forget to include 22, you've typoed it wrong and you type 23. So this is what you would actually use to drop all your table commands. And this will basically clear your firewall for you. This opens everything up. And you can actually automate this in both um, Red Hat and Debian. Debian is a little bit harder to do. With Red Hat, it's basically save it to the right file and then set that up to, in check config to actually start on boot. Debian, you have to do a little bit more massaging and um, it doesn't always work well. So running off of live CD, it gave me the host name CentOS, or actually it was host CentOS Live DVD. I didn't like that, so I wanted to change that. You know, as you can see here it is, CentOS Live DVD. In Red Hat, you're gonna change this file here, Etsy Sysconfig Network. And like I said, I'm talking about Red Hat at a point because you're gonna find this in most organizations, right? It's the big sexy for corporate. Ubuntu, Debian, you actually make the change in Etsy hostname. You have to restart your network in both cases, but you know, it changes your name. Changing passwords, simple command, right? Password. If you don't have one set up or if you're root, it'll say entry your new password. Go through, everything's changed. And it works on both systems. Add a user. So 
Backtrack doesn't add users by default. It runs everything as root. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but this is your basic way of doing to do it, or uh, how you're going to do it. Um, I didn't give it any additional commands. And it's like, just add one or two names to this and it works. Okay. And then you're going to want to make some changes on the fly. In my case, I needed 22 open. So things I don't want people to do is log in as root on 22. You know, even as a regular server, I'd want to have more logging. I want to at least know who logged in, not just, oh, somebody logged in as root, right? Try to strip it down, try to keep it going a little bit slower. So I turn off permit root login, yes. I don't want people forwarding their, their sessions through me. I don't want to be that proxy that everybody's SSHing to and logging in and it's like, yeah, I'm just going to push all my traffic across this so people at the con can't see the traffic. And then we're going to turn off X forwarding. So if it's got X installed on the box for whatever reason, you're not going to be able to pull the X interface you know, if you go into the box and say run Firefox from the server, it's not going to show up on your box if you have an X client. Um, Apache. And some people ask me, why do I have an Apache slide in here? And this isn't a knock against this particular product. But know what your products are doing when you're using them. Who knows what Nessus turns on now when you're using Nessus? It turns on Apache. You, you need to have a web server for Nessus now. And a lot of people don't think about that. It's like, hey, I need Nessus. They'll fire up Nessus. They'll get it going. And then they're like, wait, why is port 80 open? If they even check, right? So I like port 80 not to listen everywhere. I like having it listen locally if I don't need to be a web server. You know, if I'm doing something that requires it, then I'm going to turn it off and make it listen just locally. Remember the rules that said allow all local traffic, you know, the loopback address? Well, there's your loopback address. So I go through, make those changes in the config files, restart the Apache server, and away I go. Mail. Mail is a pain to set up. I hear laughing. They know I'm serious. Um, there's lots of different programs out there. There's a lot of different tools. There's Postfix, Xim, Xim, however you want to pronounce it. Um, send mail. They all work well. A lot of the problems have been that got some of those bad reps have been fixed. There's always going to be something to worry about trying to find. So again, you're going to want to change your firewall rules to let things in and out. But for the most part, um, personally, I'm running Postfix on a server that people can send me emails to, and I use that for a podcast I host. But that's another story. Um, a few extras. I really like log check. If you haven't used it, it runs through your logs as a daemon on a regular basis, and it emails you the interesting stuff. And you can tweak it to be a little bit more interesting. You know, you know, it's a little bit misogyny to get exactly what you want. Or you can just take the basic defaults, which is more or less what I use because it gives me everything I need. It tells me when the ACP updates on a box. It'll tell me who's logged in, who hasn't. Um, Tripwire, great tool. Big pain to set up in the front end, and you have to constantly update it every time you make a change. It's going to sit there and look at the files you tell it to. And why I say this is a big pain to set up in the front end, if you don't have certain things installed, you actually have to go and take them out of the config file. It assumes that you have a GUI running as root. Why? Um, but basically, you're going to go through, massage the configuration file, run the updates on it, and every time a configuration file changes, Tripwire will catch it. It runs as a daemon, it checks every couple hours, which you can set in the configs. <coughs> And eventually, you know, it's a, another way of saying, hey, this changed. Why did this change? And you can go back through and see why it changed. So if, it, if you missed it in log check, it's letting you know that somebody's been in and playing with your configuration files. Downside is every time you play with your configuration files, you need to update it. And then deny host and fail to ban. A little bit of story behind this one. I like deny host. All it does is watches your configure your authentic authentication log for SSH and it will ask you, well it doesn't ask you, it runs as, you can set it up as a daemon, it watches the logs and along the way if there's been enough failures of trying to come in through SSH, it blocks the address. You can tie it into IP tables or you can use the host tables on the server, but it'll block the address. So let's say you've got somebody out there running Hydra against the box and you say, don't allow more than five bad password attempts. Well, okay, the guy's got five bad password attempts. It's locked. Do I lock myself on my boxes on occasion? Yes, but then I know I've got a problem and I need to fix my password. 
I need something different or I need a new way to maintain it. A lot of people like fail to ban. Beyond that, it does more than just SSH. It does, um, I know Apache, because that's the only other reason I've used it. And when I first came, about, came across these, I wanted specifically SSH because it was for an SFTP server to keep people from trying to log into it to get the information that was on the server. It was a server that we were using for a partner company. This is a couple places back where I used to work. I used to work for a publishing company and we had another publishing company as a partner. We would take the images of their magazine that we scanned and we would put them on the FTP server for their, um, we would put them on the FTP server so they can log in, grab the data and do quality assurance. Yes, these scans are great of the magazine, no they're not. What we were doing was you're we archiving every single issue of Playboy to put on their Playboy Live DVD. Or not their Live DVD, but the Playboy DVD that you can buy now. The company I work for is the ones that scan those. And they were worried about people packet capturing to get the data, to get the free issues of, or back issues of Playboy digitally. So it's like we need to, we need to have this over secure FTP. Okay, not a problem. And we're worried about people trying to hack into this box. Okay, not a problem. Deny host took care of the problem for me. I set it up so that you could only get your password wrong once, made everybody use keys, and life was pretty much happy. Had a couple guys mess up. Usually they type their username in is wrong. So how does this apply to Backtrack? Well, I was lucky enough to be in the IRC podcast channel, or ISD podcast channel at one point. Pure Hate said, BT is not meant to be a secure distro. It is a security distro, but not a secure distro. And that's pretty much right. If you ever take a, an instance of Backtrack and just start playing against it, you know, use that as your victim, you'll start seeing all the different holes in it, right? Also, this is my way of social engineering you guys to let me come talk to you at a hacker conference, you know, because I'm just here to talk about system hardening. Oh, who wants to see that? I'm talking about Backtrack too. Okay. Come on, laugh. It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> Anyways, the way, when I do a Backtrack install, and I, yeah, I said install. When I use Backtrack as an attack box, I have certain setups that I like to use. I install on a hard drive and I dedicate that machine to it. I actually have a hard drive for Whistler sitting at home right now with the latest version of Backtrack on it. And when I'm going out to do something with it, I swap hard drives. A little bit of a pain on my part, but I know everything on there is what I need is on there. It's the most recent version. I do an app get update before I leave so it's patched. Get the latest tools. And I don't have to worry about my personal data being on there. Virtual machines are nice, but I don't like using those in the real world, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, again, dual booting. Dual booting is nice if it's your personal system, but if it's your attack system, and you'll see why in a minute, I don't like it. And I'm running a live DVD. Well, actually, I don't like running off a live DVD for the same reason I don't like dual booting. So let's start talking about why I don't like doing these things, and some of the stuff you'll see as you'll do this. This is a packet capture. Obviously, it's Wireshark, right? If you remember the addresses from the first, first couple slides, I think it was like slide four where I was talking about the lab, that's Whistler's address, okay? That was the host machine. The wire capture, or the packet capture, came off the virtual box running backtrack on top of Whistler. So what it's seeing there in promiscuous mode is all the traffic of its host. All I did was start Firefox. And that's all the traffic Firefox started sending out. It started checking for updates to my add-ons. It started checking for updates to my email because I've got the Gmail plugin. It started checking up for, for Yahoo updates because I have the Yahoo plugin, right? So everything that you're using on your host system from day to day is going to show up if you show up on a site trying to pop a box from a, a virtual machine. You know, if, whatever reason. Oh, I need to go double check the email I got to make sure I'm within scope, whatever. Once that loads, you're going to start blasting data out across the network saying, hey, I'm here. What's this weird thing going on? Who is this person? Why am I seeing this person? Make sense? I'm getting blank stares. I know it's after lunch. Come on, a little bit more lively, please. So when it's installed on our hard drive, if you look at the hard drive parameters, there's the hard drive in this case. So there's a Maxter. It gives you all this information. Installing it on a virtual machine, well, one of the things it does is it tells me it's a virtual box. I've actually used this in the real world. So I haven't worked for this publishing company for two years. And 
another client, well not client, but another company we were doing business with, we provided them a server. They were doing the work for us at this point. We had to send a server that did a lot of hardware intensive work to them. So we get it, we spend a week loading it up, getting all the software on it, making sure everything's working properly. We send it out to the client, and it took them two weeks, well not the client, but the partner, it took them two weeks to get the thing online. And it was constantly crashing. We couldn't figure out why. So the project manager walks over and she's like, here's an IP address, here's a password, it's the administrator password for the system, tell me everything you can find out about that system, you've got 30 minutes. And then the email pops up from the director, find everything you can find out about the system, you've got 30 minutes. And what they did, you know, so I had 30 minutes of RDP into this box, across the internet, think about that for a second, um, go into this box and start poking around to find out why this box is crashing. Nobody told me it was the box we sent out the week before, or two weeks before. Well, what they did is they applied their corporate standard to it as soon as they got it. It came in, they took it, virtualized everything that we installed on it, made a virtual host out of it, and then put our, box, our image back on top of it. Virtual servers are great unless you're doing something that's really hardware intensive. And when you're crunching large image files to make PDFs, it's hardware intensive. And we were missing deadlines because this box kept crashing. So this does leak out there. You will see this if you look. But the other reason I don't like, and this is the live CD, the dual boot, right? This is actually off of, a, of one of three hard drives. The other two hard drives are in the box, right? Well, now I know I've got, oh look, three hard drives. And what can I do? Ooh, let's go see, right? Can I mount any of these? Are they encrypted? Are they not encrypted? What, can, what information can I find on these boxes now? Right, so you're gonna go through, you're gonna start looking for this stuff. And think of this as you're attacking somebody and their, their instant response team has seen you and they're trying to find out more about you before they pull the plug to find out what's going on. Well, you're leaking your data. Why would you wanna do that? If I can get into your box and do an F-disk, no die hack. Um, if I can get into your box and do an F-disk as root, then I can mount any of those drives and if they're not encrypted, later die hack. I bring my own trolls. <laughs> um, but if they can get in root and start seeing the stuff you've got there, they can start mounting your drives, finding out who you are, stealing your own data, and now you're the one that's being hacked. What the hack? <laughs> I told you, I bring my own troll. <laughs> so I mentioned my buddy, he works at a university and he shuts down systems when he sees backtrack showing up on their network. Or he doesn't shut down the system, but what he does is turns off the network ports. That's how he does it. He does it by the name. He's got an event viewer set up to basically say, hey, I just had BT show up in my DHCP file, and the response is, kill the port. And well, let's not be, that, let's, let's not be the guy that's having the port turned off on him. So we're going to change the name. It's Debian-based, backtrack's based off Ubuntu, which is based off Debian. Um, so you go and you make the changes in SE host name. So I call the box DS Challenger. Now, I name my boxes, my personal boxes, after what my first degree is in. My first degree is actually in archaeology. My focus is underwater archaeology. So DS Challenger, Deep Sea Challenger. The box that was ASHRA, ASHRA was the first um, unmanned submarine used in archaeology. There's ASHRA. So change the password. What's the default password for Backtrack? Root Tor. So if for some reason SSH has been turned on and you've left your password that way, or they can get to your box and connect into it some other way and say, hey, Root Tor. Um, Zero was talking to me before the talk and said a buddy of his was scanning and found about 100 boxes where on the network here this weekend that still had Root Tor set up. Great, you guys can run live DVDs. Um, so really, change your passwords. It's not that hard. And then let's keep going. So I don't want to do everything as root. If I have to make edits to a small file, a text file, or I'm, I'm keeping my logs on your box, or not your box, but on my attack box, I don't need to do that as root, right? So I'm gonna add a user. And that's the steps, right? Add user, radis, it goes through, creates a new group, creates a new user, puts it inside group, 
creates a home directory, copies my scale directory, which is going to be your basic framework for your home directory. It's going to ask your password. You can add more information if you want it. It'll confirm is this correct, yes or no. Do I have to get the handcuffs out? <laughs> okay, he's got an RCHE, so. <laughs> like I said, I bring my own trolls. Well, after you create your user, you need to do by sudo, which is going to load your default editor. And in this case, it's going to be nano, I prefer vim. I lost my slide. Wow, that's so far. I'm going the wrong way. Don't mind me. You know, no live demos, and I still have a fail. <laughs> Must have pissed off the con gods this weekend. <laughs> okay, so anyways, need to set up Sue, right? Need to set up sudo. So it's nano, like I said, I prefer Vi. If you notice down here, instead of saying to all, all, and all, which is normal when you see somebody set up a Vi sudo statement, I've set it up to bin sue. Now what does that do? It basically says that that character, change to it, I can't do anything other than change to root, or actually change user, which is substitute user su. So the only command I could run is with sudo at this point is substitute user, which allows me to go back into root. Can't shut the box down. Can't change, I can't even do a print working directory. It just says it's denied. It doesn't say why it's denied. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't give you any hints. It just says you can't do this, go away. So looking at basic open ports, again, I opened 22 on my own. Everything else was blocked and I actually did a full scan. Looked at another box, said show me all your open ports. Port 80 is open. Well, on this particular box, I had Nessus running at the time and it turns Apache on with the default config which is listing on all interfaces. Going back through, looking at the UDP ports, DHCP client's open. You kind of need that if you want DHCP. So let's talk about the firewall again. It's the exact same thing. I've gone through, I've said, drop, my in, drop anything coming in, let everything out, allow local traffic on the box to do its thing. If it's in the estate, if I'm seeing the traffic out, let it back. Turn on 22, and then say drop inbound traffic. And then reject everything. So I do another scan. SSH is open. Well, what's missing? Well, where'd it go? There it is. It's not letting through stuff to port 80 because I haven't told it to actually let port 80 in. So I've now blocked people coming to the web. Still don't like that though. So I'm going to say, well, I know 80 is open, so I'm going to check it directly. And it comes back as filtered. Instead of saying, and it's just saying, I tried seeing traffic, I didn't get a reject, it just dropped it. So if I'm attacking the box, it tells me, hey, go look there a little bit deeper. If I'm not attacking the box, it's like, okay, I'm pretty much blocked the way I want it to be. And when I try doing a netcat to go to that port to, just to prove it, it gets dropped. And I know it gets dropped if the next slide's the right one. Yes. I know it's dropped because I'm seeing the dropped inbound, or drop inbound in my log. And it's saying who the source is, where they're going, and where I'm trying to go to. Which is the reason why I put the logging input in there, because it lets me see what's going on. If it's not there, it doesn't log, it just drops and doesn't tell you. So going back to the SSH config, I don't want to let people log in as root, I don't want people to do forwarding, so after I made the changes, I came back and said, show me everything that says no. Permit root login, no. And a lot of people think, well, if I comment this out, that's going to work, right? It won't show me root, it won't let root in. Actually, it will. So normally when pe people think if I comment something out of a config file, it'll stop working. Not in the case of SSH. If I remember right, it's because SSH actually has a configuration default of allowing root to come in.
And again, X1140 is off and don't allow TCP forwarding. So, no root, try logging in. Nothing happens. Now, um, remember that everything I was talking about before about the whole blocking some people trying to log in? When I actually performed this test on my network, I got locked out of my own network. <laughs> um, I don't like things listening on all ports if they don't have to. You know, I mentioned this a few times. Got the Apache. So I've gone back through and I've changed Apache. I was like, I only want you to listen locally. Don't want you listening everywhere. So I make the update, rerun it, and now I'm just local traffic. So if it's on this box, I can talk to it. If it's not on this box, I can't. So I can pull up a web browser on the box I'm running from, pull up Nessus if I need it, or any other web-based web tool, and it works. But if I'm outside that box, I don't have to worry about somebody else trying to get to it. Well, I mean, I do, but I've done what I could to prevent them from getting in. Patching. Do it after your initial install. The steps I take on an install are install, patch, tripwire. You can't hold, yeah. So install, patch, tripwire. And then you want to patch on a regular basis because things are always coming out. Whenever you do an install, unless you're doing a live network install, whatever you're installing is already out of date because there's been changes since you've started. Patching is really easy. It's two commands. Apt-get update as root. It's going to go through, it's going to hit the repository, it's going to say, show me everything that's changed. And then apt get upgrade. And it's going to upgrade your system for you. It'll ask you, you can add a little flag there that says a minus Y to say yes to your questions. I like being asked my questions. So it'll ask if there's anything that you want to do. If there's nothing to do, it'll just say done like it does at the bottom of the screen. Sorry for the guys in the back that can't see that. Last steps. Rerun Tripwire, make sure the database is up to date. Install whatever tool you want to use to fail to ban or deny host, you know, prevent remote login access. Make an image of your box before you go out on site. Because when you're doing a defensive side, you have to be constantly vigilant, where the person attack you, attacking you only has to be lucky once. So if you're going out somewhere and you're in a hostile environment, always assume that you have a compromised box when you get back and reload your grid image. You know, this is, we're talking in this case a box that's being used for attacking. But I don't want to be attacked while I'm doing the attack, right? So I want to make sure I've got a known good image seen at home. I might have to do an update. So what? And then if you're on site, save everything to a USB drive. I got that bit of advice from Boris, Jada Security. When he goes out to a site, he said that he puts everything on the USB drive, he saves all the data, all the scripts, everything he's done on their network to that USB drive, and he hands it over to them when he leaves, when he gives them the final report. Because that way they have a log of everything he's done while he was there. These are the resources I use to help make this presentation. Um, the older versions of this book are way better than the current versions. I've gone through three of these books already. It falls apart, very, very well used. As Skodos is kind of hack. And there's two volumes of this. Make sure you get both, because they're really handy for both. And then lastly, Nixcraft, which without them, I wouldn't have any of the cool slides on firewall stuff. So, questions? Besides that hack? So my lab network was actually two, sur two physical machines and three virtuals. I like virtuals for labs. I don't like them in the real world. Yeah, Astro is virtual. Challenger was a um, live box, full box. Anybody else? Yes. It's built into white. Okay. Nope. 
didn't even know about it. So, anybody else? Yes. What is my opinion of what versus secureware? Um, I haven't used it. I wouldn't know. Tripwire is what I learned on, and I kind of stick with what I've learned. This is more of a hobby now than it is a full time job, so. Anybody else? Okay, thank you, and enjoy the rest of the day.